Welcome to the Young, Healthy, and Wealthy podcast, dedicated to helping the youth of mind and body become the healthiest and wealthiest they can be. You will hear from some of the most incredible minds, whether they be entrepreneur, executive, or influencer alike. I am your host, Chase A.P. Henderson, and without further ado, let's start the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Young, Healthy, and Wealthy podcast. I am your host, Chase A.P. Henderson, and we have another phenomenal guest on the show today. Yo, y'all listen, this guy is insane. This guy is the bomb. Absolutely love this dude. Now, you're, you're going to love him too. He is the founder of Legacy Payments and specializes in high-risk payments. And that's this is going to be a whole episode to unpack because I'm really excited to learn about this. And I know you will be too. Please help me welcome the Mark Forrester. Mark, what's going on, man? How you doing? My man. Things are good, man. Things are good. Things are uh, getting busy. But it's a good thing for for me, for family, you know, so just trying to stay focused, man. That's it. Just trying to stay focused. Love it. Aren't we all? We're all trying to stay focused. So awesome. Well, you know, we'll go through some of the basics really quick and then we'll really dive deep into, you know, the conversation at hand today. But why don't you go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about who you are, what you do, but more importantly, what I like to learn is why do you do it? Yeah, man. Um, (laughs) Who I am, you know, that's still something I'm probably trying to figure out. Right. Um, I guess really at this point, it's just like my biggest focus is just family. Um, and that's probably why I do what I do. Um, so I've been in payments, right? Like the broad term of payments, um, you mentioned high risk, which is absolutely something that I focus on, but what people don't understand, I've been in payments for eight years. Um, so the first five years, I was actually employed uh, as a W-2 salary guy. So I never made residuals. Like it wasn't my own company, right? Working for, it was actually, I was hired for my father-in-law. Um, and essentially, <clears throat> I worked for him for five years and did everything from low-risk accounts pretty much. So it was all cold calling, door to door, all that type of stuff. And really early on in that career, I realized like there's a lot of people out there in terms of like the salespeople. There's a lot of salespeople out there that just, you know, it was like this bait and switch almost type of thing where it was like, hey, let me tell this guy one thing. And then all of a sudden, a month or two later comes by and it's like, they totally just didn't promise what was spoken about. So at that instant, I learned from a young age, in a sense, a young age in the career, that it's like, man, <clears throat> this is other people's money. You know what I mean? Like, like <clears throat> if you drill it down to, to the basics, like, dude, this is Bob's pizza shop or, you know, Jeremy's clam shack like this is their bloodline and now it's even more important when you get to high risk it's like dude this is the way that these guys are making money why would i ever want to jeopardize that so that's i guess to like round it all about that's kind of like why i still do this and really why i've done it for so long like you don't you don't stay in payments if you can't like equate that equation. Like you you don't stay in payments just to sling accounts. There has to be something else. And I just know the vast majority of people out there in terms of business owners, they're just not being served to the level that they need to be. Um, Especially like, yeah, rates and stuff like all that stuff matters. But man, if you're not getting paid at the end of the day, what's the point? you know? Yeah. So that's kind of it, man. That's kind of it. Um, obviously I got a a two and a half year old now. (laughs) Um, so he's like, uh, he's a big piece of everything. And my wife is a big piece of everything. I mean, we can get into like, we can get into that stuff, uh, a lot. I owe them. I owe my wife everything pretty much. Um, which definitely is something that weighs on my shoulders, weighs on my heart uh, a lot, you know? Um, and I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother story we could get into. Yeah. Well, and that is honestly one of the reasons why, like, 
I vibe, I, I vibe with you is because of how, of how you real you are in like admitting that and being able to talk about that openly of, you know, yeah. how important that family piece is. And I definitely want to touch on that. Um, but before I go into the rabbit hole of all the different things that I really want to talk about, um, just a really quick, basic question for those who might not know, what is, what is a merchant account? They, they might be listening as like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's, no idea what this guy does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's funny, man. Yeah. So merchant accounts is pretty much like, you know, when you guys are going to open up your business and you want to start accepting credit cards, uh, that is called a merchant account. So, you know, the vast majority, um, you know, I'm going to plug it, uh, against what I want to do, but you know, a vast majority of guys, they're just going to start up. They're going to, uh, you know, hit up Stripe or, or square or PayPal or whatever. Those are merchant accounts. Um, and that's kind of like the, the raw best way to describe it. So, the difference is um, those three platforms, your Stripes, your Squares, your PayPals, they're a merchant account, uh, but they're more so, it's called like a PayFAC. Um, it's an aggregator in, in the industry. And all that that means is like to have a true merchant account, you actually have a special number associated to you. Uh, called the merchant identification number. Um, whereas like with Stripe and PayPal, you don't have numbers. So essentially what I provide is the assurance that you have an actual ID uh, amongst various other things. But if this was like a, a silo, um, if this was Stripe, Everybody in the United States, matter of fact, everybody in the world that uses Stripe gets funneled through one silo, right? Whereas if I was, um, if I had a real merchant account, well, McDonald's is identified as this silo and, you know, Walgreens is identified as this silo. So it's easy to recognize who is who in order to maybe reverse chargebacks, properly fund things, all that type of stuff, um, which is, you know, another reason why, especially in like the high risk space, a lot of guys that use Stripe and, and Square um, sometimes have a, a little bit of a hard time with like um, funding or, or anything like that, just because they're all grouped into one bucket. Gotcha. Yeah. And so when it comes to the high risk aspect of it, then, so, is that, and this is kind of me guessing, and then obviously you can correct me on this. So high risk would essentially mean that it's something that there was a high chance of a chargeback occurring, or is that, is it just like a more of a dicey kind of uh, transaction going on? Well, like what, what exactly does a high risk entail? Yeah. Um, probably, I mean, very spot on with the chargeback, right? But it goes hand in hand with like, yeah, there's a high risk of, um, or a more high propensity to experience chargebacks. And that goes hand in hand with like the vertical, right? What's the industry? So that's where it's like, you know, when you do a bunch of e-com stuff like drop shipping, tremendously more prone for chargebacks, especially when fulfillment is, you know, 12 days or whatever, right? People are going to be like, dude, what's the deal? Um, and then when you get into like, coaching. So anything that's very high ticket, even if it's considered more quote unquote low risk, because, you know, like contractors, <clears throat> contractors are definitely more of a low risk thing because it's, it's uh, a little bit more accepting, right. Than like say a, a high ticket coach. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, if your average transaction is five grand or 10 grand, that's definitely more of a high risk transaction than someone just going to a restaurant, paying 50 bucks for a meal, you know? Um, so yeah, high risk, it's definitely going to be based on the vertical and just like, Hey, who are the consumers that they attract? Right. So the, the coaching space, um, drop shipping, um, like credit repair, uh, funding, you know, that type of stuff. Um, obviously like adult, right. Nutraceuticals, like the supplement industry, all that type of stuff is definitely geared more towards high risk. 
Um, because yeah, like who, who, who ends up going down to, to Bob's pizza shop eats the entire pizza and then says, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to return that. Like, dude, you know, <laughs> if, if the steak is rare, you're going to return it when they get it to you, right. You're right. going to take care of it right then. So, um, definitely those are the, the verticals, uh, that I would be working with more so for the high risk standpoint. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And so then kind of linking the two concepts of here's what a merchant account is and here's what it would be like if you were working with like a Stripe or working with an individual and then here's what the high risk is. You know, when, if somebody's listening to this, they are in that high risk bucket. You know, what is the benefit for them to go from, you know, possibly going to the, these big massive companies like Stripe or Square and going with somebody who's a little more specialized uh, in the industry like yourself? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of things that, are different at the end of the day, they both deposit money into your account. So that's the same <clears throat> with Stripe and PayPal and square. Uh, they'll do instant approvals. Okay. So I just opened up my business and I'm like, man, let me just rip a, a merchant account. I'm going to go on Stripe. I'm going to type in all my business information. And as soon as I touch enter, I mean, that thing, you know, 30 minutes, maybe, and you have your merchant account that you can go rock and roll with, right? So essentially, these three industries, excuse me, these three, three companies, they don't do underwriting. They're not looking into your account. They're not looking into you as an individual. They're not looking at anything. Whereas if you come to me, I am going to do underwriting. So the big difference initially is length of time for an approval. Now, why is it beneficial to go through an underwriting process? Well, if you come to me and you say, I'm in credit repair, or you say, I am drop shipping. <clears throat> when you come to me, I'm going to, and this is another difference, I'm going to ask for a lot of information up front. Stripe, Square, they're not going to ask for anything. So I'm going to ask, hey, man, I need these three pieces of information, which is like avoided check, right? Your, your driver's license, just like some basic stuff. But then I'm going to ask, hey, man, what does your fulfillment look like? Okay. Do you have a fulfillment agreement in place? Okay. You're a coach or you are credit repair or there's some type of agreement and contract. Hey, give me a copy of that agreement in cop in con. What right? What does your refund policy look like? I want to collect as much data up front as I can because it's more than just Stripe. It's more than just this application. It's me putting together an application, but then painting a picture of what the business is all about, what your plans of growth are, and what your reputation looks like. So now you're approved with all that underwriting taken into consideration. Whereas with Stripe, there's no underwriting. So guys get this instant approval. As soon as they start running and ripping their transactions, that's when Stripe does their underwriting. It's backwards. So now guys are a month in, they ripped 50 grand on their account month one. Stripe's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let me look into this account. And then, okay, they are a high ticket coach or they are one of these higher risk um, verticals and Stripe's like, dude, we don't accept you. Like, we're not going to take you, right? So that's where guys get money held up um, with these like absurd reserves um, or just like the worst case is just terminated altogether. So essentially the biggest difference in a nutshell outside of these small little things that, you know, Stripe will do versus what I will do. The, the biggest reason why individuals in these spaces choose to work with somebody like me is for security. It's for sustainability. It's to say, dude, I'm doing 50 grand a month right now, but we're looking to scale to a hundred or 200 a month. How do I do that properly? Well, dude, we do that properly by, having you have an account that has that added layer of protection um, because of the way that we, you know, prioritize things and, and the way we communicate their story to the bank where it's like, dude, good luck calling strike, man. 
You ain't getting nobody. I don't even think they have a support number. Yeah, exactly. I got a stripe and I'm like, I don't know how to talk to these people. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So pretty much it's like, if you already have problems at like, you know, like you said, like a 50 K level with stripe, forget about a hundred, 200 K a month. Like you got to really need that second layer. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. So that's like the biggest difference. That's, oh, that's a, that's a very big difference. That's, yeah. <laughs> I would say if you're going to be doing that much volume, yeah, you, you need to make sure you've got your eyes dotted and your T's crossed if you're yeah, going to do that. For sure. Dang. And so, and there was something you'd said uh, towards the beginning too, about this whole process. You had been in this industry for eight years, uh, W2 for five years, and now you've got legacy payments. Yeah. Uh, and you, you said that people don't just stay in this industry. Right. And you yeah. said you brought that up around the aspect of like like a second purpose. Right. You you kind of dive deeper in realizing that it's Joe's pizza shop. It's Jeremy's crab bake. It's it's it, or clam bake. And it's it's the person that's behind it. I mean, so when you made that realization, was that kind of when you made the transition from W2 to, you know, do this on your own? Or was it during kind of that whole process of like, no, I realize why I need to do this instead of just slinging sales? Yeah. Uh, it was, it was actually during my W2. Um, so after the first year, you know, you're no longer green. Um, so after one year you get not just the good feedback, but you get the bad feedback. So after a year, you know, I had plenty of the bad feedback coming back to me where, you hear the stories, man. And this is, this isn't just in the high risk space. It's in, you know, your regular mom and pop. And I would even say, you know, when it comes to low risk mom and pop retail restaurants, like it matters so much more to those guys, those guys doing five grand a month, 10 grand a month. And it's everything that they've done. It's it's their living, it's their livelihood, and they're still probably paycheck to paycheck. So it was like, man, <clears throat> especially when you're a door to door guy, you walk in cold to you know the auto shop down the street or to the even like the greasy hole in the wall diner, right? And the first thing that comes out of their mouth, the business owner is, oh, it's one of you guys again. You know, you hear the stories. These guys get burned a lot. Um, so yeah, it was after that, like hearing all that feedback, you know, you start to question like, man, I'm a year into this deal. <clears throat> um, is this the industry I want to be in? You know, all of these people are giving me this, this negative feedback. Like, is this the industry I want to be in? Or dude, take five minutes chill out, sit down, reflect a little bit. And, you know, Hey dude, can I bring some positive light to this? Is there a way I can, I can be a difference. And that's kind of what I went through. And that's like the, the pivotal point of me, like changing my mindset around that. Um, That was kind of how it all started. And then that just led to more success uh, at my father-in-law's company. Um, you know, throughout the remainder that I was there. Gotcha. Yeah. I was about to ask, but you answered it there. You know, when you made that mental shift, because I've noticed it within past ventures for myself too, is like when you do make that mental shift going from sales to purpose and like actually delivering for somebody on a higher level than just the dollar amount, like things just get, it's, I don't know if it gets easier, but it gets more doable. I think is a better yeah. way of saying No, it. exactly, dude. Because like, you know, I'm at a point where, the whole time I was there, we were quoted, right? We had quotas. So yeah, you're at a point where you're like, dude, it's so easy for me to just go in and say whatever I have to do to get my quota. Or it's like, dude, how do I do this properly and still hit and exceed my quota? I totally get where you're coming from, where it's like that that sales, right? It's like, dude, I could be the salesy guy that's just like everybody else in the industry, or I could have this purpose locked into my mind, still understand the sales concepts and and how to navigate objections and all of that. Um, But be able to leave there with a deal, knowing that they're in, they're going to be in a better position, right? Not thinking like, Hey man, is this going to fuck me down the road? You know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because you don't want that to come back. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
Damn. And so when you're going through this process of being in this industry, you make this realization, um, you know, you did make that switch. You went from being W2 to opening your own company and doing this. Yeah. What led to that transition? Yeah, dude, that wasn't by choice, bro. Um, and this is the first time publicly, I would say it. Um, there are people that know my story, um, but I mean, not like, I don't really talk about it. Um, it was February. So my son was born in February of uh, 2020. <clears throat> and I just kind of paint this picture because like, this is like, this is just how I was feeling at the time. You know, my son's born February, 2020. Um, so then March comes along and uh, it was like the last week of March or whatever and whatever COVID, you know, I get it. COVID was, was probably a reason, you know, I, I get it. I, I, I'm not naive. Um, and it was a Sunday night and, uh, my father-in-law was at the house just playing with my kid, um, whatever, just having a, a, a regular Sunday, you know? Um, and Monday, the next day comes along and I get a phone call from my, um, my mother-in-law. So it, it, my, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, um, my father-in-law is the CEO of the company. And uh, my mother-in-law is the president. So my mother-in-law gives me a call uh, on Monday. <clears throat> and she's like, hey, dude, you're done. Like, we're letting you go. And I was like, well, wait, what? <clears throat> I got a fucking one month old at home. And it, I was just, dude, I was like so taken aback because, first of all, I was pissed off that my father-in-law wasn't the one that that called me. I was more upset that, dude, you were just at my house Sunday. You're telling me you just woke up Monday thinking, yeah, we're going to do it. Dude, you knew you were going to do it. You should have just done it at my house. Um, so yeah, I definitely like, I bitched and moaned for 24 hours for sure. Uh, but in the second day, my wife, um, she's a contract attorney. <clears throat> um, yeah. In that second day, I looked at her and I was like, file my LLC. I'm doing this on my own. And I'm just, you know, I haven't looked back. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's like the whole family dynamic thing. That's something I never would want anybody to go through. Um, cause it probably, I mean, it's still, you know, we got to see each other all the time. You know what I mean? Um, so that's been like my biggest challenge is, Hey dude, I have to start at zero you know? Um, and that's been like the, the biggest challenge for me. Um, but I've been fortunate enough to meet different people in the industry and, and now people that I call mentors, you know? Um, but that was like the big, the big hurdle that I had to get over. Um, but Hey man, you know, it is what it is. And now we're here. Well, I was gonna say, yeah, now you're here. That is a, I mean, that's, that's tough. And I'm sorry you had to go through all of that, especially like the specific dynamic of it all. That's, yeah, I don't know how I would handle it. I, I, yeah. it's tough. So I feel you know, props to you for, you know, taking action that, you know, that next day and the being like, you know what, I'm do I'm going to do this on my own. So when you made that decision um, and we had talked about family a little bit before, like, you know, what was going through your head as far as family went for, you know, you've got your wife that's there to support you and you've got your son now that you've got to take care of. I mean, that's gotta be, that's gotta be a lot. I mean, this is another thing that's not talked about a lot. I mean, I'm sure it is. Um, and I'm not going to say that I went through this depression, but looking back, like I was definitely low. Um, it's like, dude, <clears throat> in our society, what, what have we been taught all of our lives? You know, you're a man. You have to be the breadwinner. You're a man. You have to take care of the household. So that that was the thing that like really hit me is like I'm the man and I'm I'm looked at and we've been taught by our fathers and we've been taught through media and we've been taught through all different types of upbringing that we're supposed to be the strong, you know, males. We're supposed to be the breadwinners. And um, I don't know if you guys, how payments work 
is just because I make a sale today does not mean that I get paid. Um, I get paid off of residuals. So when I get account an account, let's say, uh, just for the sake of like, let's say it's September 1st and I just landed that account. I'm not going to get paid until October on that money, right? <clears throat> so there's a little bit of a ramp up there. So yeah, man, like those first six months, um, that was an ego check for sure. Like not only are you not in my mind, you're not a man because your wife is fitting the bill for everything, dude. Your wife is paying for your fucking car. She's paying for everything. And that's like, that's why I say like, I owe everything to her. Uh, not only now, but it's almost like, it's almost like the story of our life, dude. Like uh, in college, <laughs> um, she wrote like three of my last final papers. And it's the only reason why I stayed in school. If not, I would have been kicked out. But luckily, she wrote like three of my papers, um, so they placed me on academic probation instead of just kicking me out of school. Uh, kicking me out of school, um, and it's just like small stuff like that, man. So here she is again, having to take this dude that and just support him. And for that, I'm like, man, what the hell do I have to do to like get that back? You know. And the other thing that people don't talk about, and again, it's like an ego check that. I have to deal with and like a lot of days I'm good with it, but not only am I trying to build my own company, but okay, now I got nothing. Now I have to start from scratch. Now my wife is paying for literally fucking everything. She's the breadwinner. So at the same time that I'm trying to focus and build this as fast as I can, I also know, dude, you need to be the wife almost in a sense, like you need to take care of Mark. You need to do the laundry. You need to do the dishes because now you have to support her to make this money to support us. That was a huge ego ego um, check. It's like the whole masculinity thing just out the door, dude. Like I am doing, I felt like a mother uh, and I felt like, you know, I just, yeah, that was, it was a hard time. It was a hard time, but um, it was good to, to not, I wouldn't say it was good to go through. It's not like I wish that, you know, people go through it. Um, but that was something that I think, hopefully, I'd like to say has been able to make me evolve into like where I'm at now. And just, you get a better vibe. You get a better view of like, hey man, what really matters? And, and what's just kind of like this nominal bullshit that like, dude, you don't need to be stressed out about everything, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, like, like you said, like, I, I wouldn't want to go through that. Like, it seems fucking hard. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, you learn a lot through those hard lessons. Like, I mean, we, we you by both heard the quote was like, smooth seas don't make skilled sailors. Yeah, so, like, being able to go through that, like, while it might be like, it's hitting your ego, and it's tough, and it's hard. But like, I'm sure you came out the other side, just like 10 times the man you were before. Yeah, you know, the and I will tell you too, like, you know, being there with your son through all that, like, I, I can, I mean, he's, Two, two, three, so two and a half. Yeah, 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 but he's yeah. got that that innate connection now, where like that's going to be massive just growing yeah. up. So that's that's huge. That's another one right there for you, man. Um, yeah, man. Yeah. So what's what's it like raising that two year old, man? <laughs> it's, it like it's, it's, it's a it's a challenge, bro. Like <laughs> everybody, like growing up, dude. Like you know, parents are all like, "Oh man, when's the grandkids?" Like, dude, nobody tells you like your life is over. <laughs> um, and I, I mean that, I mean that in a sense where it's like, <clears throat> people need to be prepared um, and not like financially prepared. Like the finances will come, but as much, I love my son, my son, Mark Anthony Forster, the third, like that was everything to me, you know? There's nothing I wouldn't do for my son. The the small little smiles, seeing him walk for the first time, like all of those moments matter so much, you know, um, because it 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 keeps you growing and it keeps you 
really grounded to like the small little things and, and how beautiful those moments are. Um, but in people, you know, I know a lot of people that do go through it. It's like, you don't get alone time anymore, you know? So like, that's the, that's the tough part. Other than that, man, I wouldn't trade it for anything, but if I could really reflect a little bit more, would I have liked to spend, you know, another year in marriage uh, by ourselves and and try to be able to experience things, you know, because now we're like, dude, we're not going to get time until we're empty nesters. Right. Um, but yeah, his um, his whole personality, seeing him change, um, seeing him talk, you know, he's he's two and a half and he's he's throwing and swinging baseball, uh, swinging baseball bats like that stuff's awesome, bro. That stuff's awesome. Um, and I mean, I, I owe a lot of that to, yeah, it was, it, it's great that I get to spend so much time with him. Um, but again, it's like the, uh, the mentality behind it too. Like there was a lot of inner work that I needed to continue to do to, to be that father for him. Um, which obviously, we both share that in, in common with, um, with the brotherhood and stuff like that. That was a, a big piece of like my continuing evolution more so on a fathership standpoint than from a tactical business strategy standpoint. Right. So it's kind of like, um, I'm not sure if they did this during your evolved. I'm pretty sure they might've, but it's kind of like having that, you know, having, you know, Mark Jr. Right there with you is kind of like a 24 seven holding up the mirror type of experience i'm not gonna say evolve like made me Mm -hmm. um but evolve like shout dude shout out to wake up wealthy and like brody and them like guys are studs evolve was huge um the first evolve was in february and they were like dude you need to come i remember that i was like dude my son's gonna be born in a week i can't come (laughs) So the next one was in like June um, and they were like, now's the time. And I was like, now is the time because now he's five months old. It served me so much more. So all of that, like I really just attacked these labels that I had identified myself with. And when I came back home man, I showed up as a more powerful husband, as a more powerful father um, but also through the people that I networked with that were also there, that actually started the whole high risk thing in the beginning, dude, you know, um, like when I was still employed, <clears throat> I was already in the brotherhood, all these guys and people in my network, they were all high risk dudes hit me up for merchant accounts and my father-in-law couldn't touch them. So I was like, what do I do? So then this stuff happens. I start out. I'm like, when I first started, all I was doing was what I knew. I was just slinging low risk accounts. Dude, just get paid, just get paid, just get paid. You go to evolve. And then I link up with one of the guys, um, credit repair. So I was like, okay, uh, let me learn credit repair. Boom, got his account approved. And then I just studied it. I said, dude, <clears throat> this is the steps that I took to get the account approved. This is what underwriting looked at. And this is what they wanted back from me. So now I was like, okay, I'm going to run this same play for every credit repair company that I possibly can, um, which is why a majority of my, my portfolio is, uh, is credit repair right now. Um, because I wanted to just hone in on that, but yeah, dude, like that was really, I had a few high risk accounts, but like after the evolve and coming back, that was when I have this connection in credit repair. I got this account. I'm just going to leverage this. So that served me from a, from a father standpoint, from a, from a husband standpoint. And then the business, uh, evolve was like, dude, it was you know, and I know you have your own experience too. It, it really, uh, it, it helped a lot, uh, into shifting like where we are, um, where I am in terms of like my company now 
Um, and again, these like mentors and these relationships that I now have, uh, it started really because I was let go, you know, I wouldn't be here if, if none of that happened. So yeah, it sucks, but dude, it, uh, it's a blessing, bro. Absolutely. Yeah. That whole experience was like, it tore you down so you could build yourself up again. Yeah. And that was like, you know, you go through that and it's so empowering. Cause you, like you said, you have those labels. So it's like, Oh, I can't build myself up if you break me down. That's kind of like, at least for me, that was a mental chatter. But then, you know, you go through that, you're like, oh, wait, shit. I actually know exactly where these pieces need to go. I feel like Superman. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is great. And, yeah. and then from there, you just build and build and build like you have. And it's like king of the world. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it was, uh, it was, it was, it was pivotal, man. It was pivotal. I, I still got um, that notebook. <clears throat> and uh, in the notebook, I ended up coming back um, and I went on like a hike or whatever. I was like, I was like back. I was still high off of the trip. I was like, man, let me kind of like really like just get away and just go for a walk and like reflect on all this. Right. So I ended up just writing in this notebook, like um, sales management, like who I'm going to oversee the money um, you know, impacting people, uh, training people, like, right, just right, right, right. And, uh, dude, sure enough, like, here I am, got my own company, my own portfolio. And now I'm, you know, doing the training company. It's just, it's kind of weird, you know, ran an, ran an event, right? Like, hey, helping people at event, like, so like, whatever was written in that it's, it's woo woo stuff, man. But, uh, yeah, it, it definitely like, you know, you, you think about it, you, you, you manifest it long enough. Like, I mean, I'm the type of person that just believes like, that's the deal. That's the deal, dude. Yeah. It's, it's woo woo for sure. But like, once you've seen it happen once, you're like, oh yeah, this is how the world works. You can, you yeah, can you ain't going exactly. back. Yeah. You ain't going back. Exactly. Exactly. That's wild. So, um, I want to, I want to dive a little bit into, so what are some of those things that you wrote, right? That you really have seen manifest since then? I know you said you've got this company. You've said you now have a training company, which I'd love to learn about that. You had yeah. to invent, like, what was it that you were writing and what was it that you, that you really wanted to manifest down the line? Well, I just knew, I knew a big thing was like, how do I impact business owners? But how do I just impact people in general? Um, so like the mentors that I have are the unicorns in this industry, like anomalies in this industry and pretty much, um, I reached out. I, I don't even know how we got linked up to be honest. Um, I think I needed help with a high risk account. They're the go-to people for the high risk account. Um, and I just needed a place to put it. So, um, we got linked up and then a few months down the road, literally when I got home from evolve, I saw something on like LinkedIn. <clears throat> um, and it was like something about, you know, the, the, my mentors, oh, they offer training. I was like, okay. Boom. So I invested in myself and I started working with them. I started working with them, like learning high risk, right? Learning high risk, learning high risk. And then all of a sudden you end up going from, you know, being a student and like training and like learning this process to now like being a family. Um, and it's just, it, it's kind of weird how this industry is extremely small. Um, and I don't know what I had done, but they were just like, man, you know, you're not like other people in this industry. Uh, so they kind of just, they were working on something on the side and they allowed me, they, they brought me in to, to help them build this. Um, so I've been doing this now. I mean, almost, almost as long as I've been out of Evolve. Um, so yeah, some of the things I wrote down, like in the book was like, have a train, like have a training company, um, run an event. Uh, that's something that I've talked about with my father-in-law 
for years when I was with him is like, dude, how do we train other merchant sales reps and like help them? <clears throat> nah, man, that's stupid, right? Like that's idiotic. Why would I want to do that for to competition? Well, dude, if it makes the industry better and we get paid, like who cares? There's over a million small businesses. Like you're going to tell me you can go get them all. So, right. It makes you look uh, better. And then you only have your pool that you can really get. Yeah, so, so like, exactly. It really exactly. is a big win. Yeah. So yeah, this thing is, this thing that we're building is extremely disruptive. We're taking people that have no prior industry experience, like legit, you're a nine to five guy and you're looking for something else. You come on and we train you to then do what we do and go out and build your own book of business and take it wherever you want to take it. Um, so we've been doing that very successfully. We have a thousand or uh, we might be up to 1500 or more now that have come through the platform um in like a 18 month time um wow yeah and uh yeah dude in may may of 20 yeah may of 2022 we had an event in scottsdale uh that we like had these guys at and i spoke on stage and i was like i was like after it i was like oh dude like I, this actually just happened like, dude, Rick Ross was there. Raekwon was there. The Iron Cowboy was there. Like, dude, I'm in this room that I don't feel like I should be in. But uh, yeah, man, like you get linked up with the right people and you get into these bigger circles, you're going to get introduced to somebody that you feel like you have no reason you should be there. But like, it was at that point where I was like, okay, dude, just like own this. Like you have these relationships now. Like, this isn't a, this isn't a dream. This is what you've been writing down, you know? Absolutely. Oh, wow. That is incredible. Yeah. That is a mad, that's a, that's an awesome story of manifestation. I am definitely going to be Dude. trying to clip that as much as I can for social. Yeah. Uh <laughs> quick, quick, quick story about Rick Ross. Oh, let's hear it. Yeah. So <laughs> he's emailing back and forth about his requirements for this event, right? And on the, uh, on the email or whatever, he's like, oh yeah, this is what I require that you guys have to pay for, for me to even come. And it was all alcohol. It was like all of his Bel Air. It was like, you need to pay for, I think it was 15 bottles of Bel Air. It, dude, it was, it was a stupid amount of alcohol. And all that he did was he took what we bought and he put it on stage next to him as branding. And during his speech, he's like, I don't go anywhere without this stuff next to me, without branding next to me, without marketing next to me. Right. <laughs> so he was sipping on, um, he was sipping on like this, one of his whiskeys or vodkas or whatever. Um, didn't touch. He like, didn't touch any of it. So all of a sudden the event's over and he like turned to us and he's like, Oh yeah. Uh, you guys can just like keep that. So like we brought this 15 bottles of Bel, Bel Air back to the reception or whatever. We're like, dude, what are we going to do with this? Um, so that was funny. I mean, the, the people that attended the event, you know, we just ended up having a good time and, and sharing it. But that was, I was just like mind blown by, this guy literally just wanted us to pay for his stuff so he could put it on stage. And then he just gave it to us anyways. Uh, I yeah. thought that was kind of cool. That That is a, I mean, like if you look at it from his perspective, I would say like smart, you know, you make smart. more, more brain. Awesome. Smart. <laughs> I definitely would be sitting there just kind of a little confused. Like what? Because we're looking <laughs> at the, we're looking at the bill and we're like, this is what it, first of all, not just what it costs to get him here. Right. Not just what he charged us to speak, but then charging. We're like, what is going on? <laughs> you know, Man, yeah, that, was that one must have been awesome, though. Having have, I mean, having Rick Ross at an event. Like yeah, that, that's insane. Yeah. yeah, that was awesome. He was he was a stud. 
Byron Cowboy was a stud too. He uh he is he made a lot of people, yeah. I love his story. He made a lot of people cry, dude. He was uh he was a savage. Yeah. No, I dude's a he's cause he's the one that does the uh he did the 50 Iron Man races in 50 days, right? Yeah, yeah. And, it, and then he went and did a hundred, didn't he? He recently did the hundred or something. Crazy, dude. Crazy. Dude, I'm winded after two days in the gym. I don't know how he yeah. <laughs> how he's doing Iron Man's in a hundred days. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Man. All right. Well, now I know if I have Rick Ross on the show, I'm gonna have to get like like I'm gonna change my backdrop to just Bel Air and Bel Air. Just- <laughs> That's it. That's it. Oh <laughs> man, that is incredible, dude. Yeah. What What was the uh? Because have you you you've done events before though, right? Because I think you did one. Yeah. So actually, that's a that's a funny story in and of itself. Um, Love it. That's how I even got linked up with Brody in the first place, man. Um. Yeah, dude. So back in college, you know, I went to school with this kid, and it's 2019 now. Um. And I was like, my wife and like my wife's best friend, they were like, oh, you, you you hearing what this dude's doing? I'm like, no, I don't really follow him. All of a sudden, I like go on his Instagram. The kid's got like 150,000 followers. He's got this merch line. He's like doing all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, wow, damn. So I start following him, this and that. And uh, I see he's going to uh, the Cardone uh, Growth Conference in Miami. And me and my wife are going. So I like DM'd him. I was like, bro, you're going to be in Miami or whatever, like for this and that. I was like, let's link up. We didn't, but he kept talking to me. So all of a sudden he's like, hey, dude, I've been seeing what you're doing. I want you to start helping me with this merch line. Like, I want you to start helping me with this company. I was like, yeah, man, that's cool. Like, I'll do it. Um. So all of a sudden, like, you know, he's like, oh, well, I'm going to rebuild this brand. I'm going to launch this and that. I want to run an event and uh, and do it. And dude, like that was a, I've never ran an event before in my life, right? So here I am, 2019, my wife's like seven or eight months pregnant at this point. And uh, he starts asking me for money, dude. He's like, I need you to... Uh, you know, I need this type of investment for the, for the brand. And like, we need to get all these speakers. And I'm just like, what did I get involved in? Like, dude, you tell me you want Ed Milet at this, at this conference. Like, wh- what are you doing? So I'm just like, I got linked up with Brody. Cause uh, I heard him on somebody else's podcast as I was, that I was linked up with. And I was like, okay, bet. Like, let me ask him to be a speaker. And he was like, dude, done deal. Then I joined the brotherhood and he was like, dude, done deal. Right. Um, Easy, easy money. Yeah, absolutely. Easy. (laughs) And he, all he, he was like, dude, just pay for my flight and and my hotel. I was like, sick. Done. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, we ended up getting him and then I just kind of spider webbed it from there. Um, So I ended up getting Brody. I ended up getting Casey Adams. I ended up getting, um, Tony Peck, dude, shout out to Tony Peck and, and uh, Why Not You Media. Like those guys are hilarious. Um, but I ended up getting like all these people. And uh, yeah, I don't know how it happened, bro. I even got a sponsor. Um, Greco, this 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 restaurant out in Boston got, uh, got, us, uh, got a sponsor from it. So they gave us like two grand, right? And here I am not knowing what I'm doing. I'm selling all these tickets. Um, we still lost a shitload of money. Um, by the end of it, I was 11 K in the hole again with a seven, eight month old, uh, pregnant wife. And that's when after the event, you know, the event was sick because it was like, Hey, I got, I got to like do this and it was a good experience And the 11,000. It was a good loss. Like it was a good learning experience. Um, not only from like a, Hey, know who you're doing business with type of standpoint, um like that was probably the biggest lesson was like dude like know who you're getting in bed with like you know um because it just turned out he just wasn't who he was you know um but those relationships have lasted forever now um but it's definitely a a, we lost i mean we lost money on the, the the may event events are hard bro rarely do you make money on them you know um 
but yeah, that's a, that's a definitely a side story. I, uh, that was a point too in my life where I was like, dude, you just lost this much money. Like every time I lose money, it's like, it's a good learning experience. Um, cause I don't really, don't really tend to lose money anymore. Um, but that definitely like running an event is not this easy task. Like it sucks. Oh yeah. I can, I could only imagine. I mean, I know, um, Back in college, I was the homecoming chair for my fraternity. And that alone, it's not like a huge thing. I mean, it was for the school, but like even that it's not an event like this. I was stressed out of my mind. Yeah. Like, oh dude. my God, I have all these moving pieces. I gotta take care of this person, that person, all of these people here. I gotta get people in the door. I gotta and then now with an event where it's like, okay, this is real money up front. <sighs> yeah, I I, I I I have a whole level of respect for anybody who can throw an event. That's tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it comes with this positive stuff too, you know? So, yeah. Cause you end up meeting Rick Ross, which is a uh, pretty cool. Meeting Ross. <laughs> meeting Ross. Yeah. Yeah. I got a picture with him. Um, that was cool. That was cool. What was really cool though, is like, you know, you're, you're training these people and you're seeing these people succeed and like, you're changing lives. Um, and to be able to like shake their hands and like, have those conversations in person that was uh that was a, a pivotal moment for me where it was like man this thing's real you know so yeah. that was that was that was like icing on the cake bro yeah because even even though like on the on a spreadsheet yeah we might have a loss but like that interaction with somebody who is now looking to you as like you know like almost like a savior like you have changed my life i that's got to be a whole other i mean that just makes everything worth it yeah definitely because like these guys the way that I think about it is like, yeah, like these guys are family. Like these guys didn't just pay to like join this program, bro. Like they stuck around, they're winning and I get to meet them in person. Like this was a business relationship that turned into much more than that. It's like, Hey, how do we grow together now? And like, that's the beautiful thing about it all. Again, you don't see this in the industry. Like everybody that joins is technically competition to each other. You know, you're all, you're all going after business accounts and they just, the way people help each other out, it's, uh, it's phenomenal, man. It's phenomenal. It will never be, uh, it, it's never going to be able to be replicated period. That's awesome. That's how you, that, I mean, that's how you stand out. That's how you do really well. Yeah. Awesome, man. So yeah. kind of uh, what I've noticed here is that, you know, going from this, the the first event to this next event, uh, you know, different people involved. Yeah. Like you said, be careful who you get in bed with. It seems like, seems like you're, you're in bed with the right people this time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. thank God. Uh, <laughs> and that's something, you know, I wouldn't say that you have to learn it the hard way, but dude, that first event um, in 2019, that whole culmination leading up to the it hardened me right it it made you realize like you know dude people have their own moral agendas and and everybody has their own whatever and you know what sometimes it, it ain't gonna be in your best interest dude so yeah i'm definitely more careful with uh with who and 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 you know who i share stuff with uh and who i choose to do business ventures with. Um, and I think that that's something that everybody needs to know. You know, I think, I think everybody needs to understand that you need to really know the ins and outs of things before you get involved with something, whether it's an investment, whether it's a business, uh, whether it's mentorship, like, dude, who are you going to buy a coaching program from? Have you researched it? Because are you going to get involved with this mentorship program and this stuff? And you realize like the guy doesn't even have money, like, and he's teaching you about money. You know, there's just simple stuff like that. I think Cardone talks about that a lot. He's like, you know, so those are things that definitely have transpired me. I'm a loyal dude, you know, and um, that was a, a, a negative for me. 
it's a, it's a much more positive thing for me now. Cause I'm smarter. Um, but I'm a very loyal guy. So like, I'd be loyal to anybody, but now it's like, dude, just choose who you're going to be loyal to. And then, you know, do that. Um, it's sir. Every, everything serves you. Everything serves you, whether you think it does or not. And that's like the whole Carol Dweck, like uh mindset stuff, you know, fixed or, or whatever her two little mindsets are like, everything will serve you. And as long as you remain on your path uh, and don't buy into this victim bullshit, you'll be all right. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It's the, I think it's the, yeah, the open and fixed mindset. I think Something like that. It's like yeah. the general one. I'm not sure if that's Carol Dwex though. So I might be wrong, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's huge. So, um, I had a question about something else, but this, I really love this topic of conversation. So, when it comes to that opened and fixed mindset, you know, a lot of us are kind of shoved or programmed into that fixed mentality just because of the way that we live in an industrialized society. It's like stick here, anything outside of that, cut it off, right? Because it's going to be, it's going to be noise. It's not good. It's not safe. It's not whatever. It's not comfortable. So what are some of the steps that you have taken to be able to break out of that? You know, if you were in a fixed mindset at one point, I don't know if you were or not. Uh, but if you were, how do you break out of that? And how do you find that open mindset kind of world? And how do you stay there despite, you know, you know, the 11,000 down or the event or, um, you know, the, the career transition, like despite all of those things happening, how do you stay in that mindset of the attitude of gratitude and realizing that this is actually a, a learning potential, a learning opportunity and a stepping stone to the next level for my life? Yeah, man. As uh, easy as it says as easy as it sounds coming out of my mouth like it just reps and unfortunately it's easier said than done but it's constant reps of putting yourself in that mindset and putting yourself in that feeling of gratitude whereas if you're in this fixed um if you're in a fixed mindset you're not even going to try so being from a fixed mindset and having all these things that I was taught and things that I was told, okay, go against the grain once, you get a bunch of pushback. But to continue to go against the grain, that's really how you stay open. You know, my parents hate talking about money. It's just like, well, whoa, don't talk about money, right? My father-in-law, you'll never make it doing residuals. You're never going to make money doing residuals. Okay. So I bring up to my parents, hey, man, I'm making this. Boom, huge pushback. What would happen if I make this? More pushback. So everyone outside of you is trying to contain you you right they're trying to make you be that lobster and 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 pull you back in all you got to do is just keep doing the reps so i think the biggest thing that helped me um was really i mean it's just i invested in in the brotherhood i mean that helped me a lot you know and and maintaining that um but really other things were just simple things like continuing to put myself out there um continuing to look at what high level performers were doing and how they were thinking and modeling them instead of modeling the mediocre that were raised around. Um, and definitely like the gratitude stuff that was, that was, all, that's always been big. Um, you know, I would say gratitude more so than like meditating. I like to meditate. Um, I don't do it regularly. Um, but like, I used to have this practice, man. And I still do some form of this every day is like, dude, as soon as I get out of bed, like when my two feet hit the floor, it's like, okay, dude, I'm here. We're good. Right. Like live in the now. That was one thing that like just changed me to be more open instead of fixed is just that level of gratitude. And then, yeah, if you can, if you're seeing other people do things, you need to you need to ultimately know that you can do it too. 
And the more that you put that repetition into your head, that's when the lightning bolt, uh, the light bulb will go off. And like, that's when the real change happens. But if you can't even fathom it, it's never going to work for you. Um, so I still push the limits with like conversations with my parents and tell them about what I'm doing in business because I want to push them a little bit because I want to help them understand what I'm going through um, and let them know that this stuff is real, you know? Um, and that's made me a lot more open, um, which losing that first 11,000 made me more open to, do I want to be fixed and, and let this define me or, Hey dude, you know, Bezos lost this much money, you know, X, Y, Z lost this much money. Andy Frisella didn't make dick for five years. Hey dude, maybe this is just a part of the plan. You know, you're not the only guy that's lost money in business. Right. So get over it. <laughs> Keep, keeps me open, right? Keeps me fluid. Hey, what can I take from this? Um, and without the right people, that's another thing to like wrap up that question. If I didn't have my wife to support me through the 11,000 loss to the letting go loss, I, I'd be fixed. If I didn't have the Brodies and the people that I met at the event to be like, hey, dude, this is where I'm at. Just in full transparency, this kid may be speaking negatively about me because I told him I was out. Um, and they were just like, bro, we we read the scene and just know like this is a part of business. So it, it made me more comfortable, right? So your circle definitely is going to dictate if you're fixed or not, you know, and, and like shout out to my boys. You guys will never hear this, but like on my phone, my best friends from college, we're all in a group chat. I mute it because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about, you know, what, what you're drinking today. I don't care. So as much as I love them and I respect them, like there's another circle of influence that I want to level up to, you know? Um, and that's really what it comes down to, man. It's, it's just about constant repetition. It's about keeping that circle tight. Uh, and it is about kind of pushing that boundary with people that you do love and like making sure that they know where you're going. Um, so you don't have to hide it, you know? That's massive. And I know that's that's one that uh, I think a lot of people that especially what at the end tail end of that is your circle, right? You know, proximity is power. We've heard all these things. You are the result of the five closest people around you. But actually making that transition, especially if you are, like you said, like in that kind of group of guys who are just talking about what am I drinking today and going into a group of guys or, that are like, you know, here's how much I made in sales today. You know, like it, it could be yeah. something as simple as that. That's a tough switch because you're trying not only changing groups of people, but you have to change a, you have to change as an individual to go from this group to that group. And, you know, it's hard. It's really hard to do that. But if it was easy, everybody would do it. And that's what makes it so worthwhile when you do make that switch is because of how hard it is. And you go, oh, snap, I just did that. Like, and it gives you another level of confidence that just pushes you even further. So I yeah. think, you know, you highlighting that was fantastic. Re I really yeah. love that concept. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dude, it goes, it goes for everything. Um, mm -hmm. even being on this, like yeah. I'm a quiet, I'm a quiet guy. You know what I mean? Um, and that's like another thing. It's like, I could have easily just not wanted to do this, you know, and I'm, I'm extremely introverted and something that Grant Cardone said, and I'll, I'll use his line to the end of time is, uh, you know, he's always like, dude, I'm an introvert. And a lot of the successful business owners are introverts. And um, he said this one line early on in my career, because I was trying to learn sales. Um, he said, you're only an introvert until you extrovert. And that was a big shift for me. Dude, my phone. That was a big <laughs> shift for me. Um because I was, a, I was an extreme introvert. So I was like, I'm door knocking day to day. I hate 
cold calling. I mean, nobody loves to cold call, uh, you know, like you're not going to find someone that's like, oh yeah, dude, give me a phone book. I, I love, I love making phone calls. Favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. But being that, you know, I just played Jim Carrey. That was really, that was a, a changing point in my life. It was like, dude, I'm an introvert, but that doesn't mean I can't be an actor for the day and go extrovert when I have to. So all that type of stuff, like really just drills it down to your circle. Um, but it really just drills it down to like, we can do what we want. And, and these labels don't have to mean anything. It's just a label. Exactly. That's huge. I never would have pegged you as an introvert. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Never would have pegged you as a, you're a great actor, but yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. the same way. Yeah. I'm just like my 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 weekend. Like the one rule that I have on uh, on Saturdays, and people that work with me know this. Um, I work until two p.m. on Saturdays. After that, you can't find me. It's family time, like blocked off, like family time, like. If I had it my way, dude, I'm a hermit. Like I would be in, even, even when I was in college, bro, like even in college, like I was always the wallflower. Like yeah. I would, I would just post up if, if we were out at a bar, if we were at a party, like, dude, you're just going to catch me kind of posting up and I'll engage when I have something important that I want to say. But like, until then, dude, it just doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that doesn't work in sales. So you have to you know, how do I shift my mindset into this other character? That's just how I roll, you know? That is nuts. I literally, literally in the same way. Like I, I've yeah. got my little studio here. It's just me. I, this is my paradise right here. Like yeah. This was me doing my thing. I make a lot of content. I do this podcast. I don't talk to me. <laughs> I'm very much oh, like man. the introverted type of deal too. But yeah, like to that point, another thing that I do uh, kind of on top of it. I love that. Uh, I looked down earlier. I wrote down that quote that you gave me. I, I love that. That is a, you're only an introvert to your extrovert. I love that. Um, but something I've been doing too, is like with a lot of the introversion, at least on my side, I don't know if that applies to you. Uh, but some introverts, like they're kind of, they have the social anxiety. So they get like, there's a little bit of fear in that social anxiety. So, um, I heard some, uh, uh, tick say this a couple months ago, where she was talking about how do I deal with my social anxiety? How do I deal with my fear? I don't, I just do things scared. And I'm like, yeah. Oh damn. It's like, you just do it scared. Put on the Jim Carrey mask. You're only an introvert uh, until you're an extrovert. Like you just, it's not comfortable, but That's you do it because you know you need it. And it's like, Holy, like it, 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 it's wild. Like how easy it becomes once you kind of like take these quotes to heart and you really like let it embed inside you. Like, Oh wow. Really isn't that bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's hundred percent, dude. hundred percent. Like these people, even before this, when I would take guys on the road at my father-in-law's company training new reps, like, man, Mark, you make it look so easy. Dude, that doesn't mean that I'm still scared to get, like, I don't like cold calling, you know? Right. But I, you open the door and guess what? Two things are going to happen. Yes or no. Sick. And you move on with your life. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I vibe with that a lot. The, uh, the whole dude, you just do it scared. Right. Because yeah, there's, there's two outcomes that are going to happen. You're going to open the door and you'll find gold on the other side, or you're going to open the door. Someone will tell you no, and you can move on either way. When you open that door, guess what? There's no boogeyman. They do not exist. Right. So this whole fear that has been killing you Either way, dude, you're not going to find the boogeyman coming to take you down after, you know? Right. So it's just, it's all made up. I love that. Dude, that is, and I, I think that's an incredible topic to start to wrap things up on. Dude, this has been an incredible conversation. I've really enjoyed all of this. I mean, you've, there's so many gems. Social media is going to be so Appreciate thankful you. with all the clips that we're going to get out of this. Um, but before we wrap things up, right, I've got two questions for you. I ended the show on two questions. The first one is, <clears throat> what is something that you expected me to ask you during this whole uh, talk that I didn't ask you? Dude, I thought you were going to rip on like high risk the whole time, which is nice because as much as like it's cool for like branding and like, oh, people can reach out to this dude because he like does high risk payments. Bro, do you know how boring talking about credit card <laughs> processing is? 
it is the like like good luck making social content around credit card. No one likes talking about this stuff. So I'm just glad, not just like a specific question. I'm glad like this conversation was not just catered towards merchant processing because no one would have listened to this thing. <laughs> the least listened to episode on the show. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Awesome. We can talk about it if you want to. Or no, we, we can. We can <laughs> We can skip that. <laughs> Let's give that for another time. All right, cool. All right. Awesome. Cool. All right, all right. And so then the second question then would be, imagine that you are, you know, you are hosting this show. You are the host of the Young, Healthy, Wealthy podcast, and you are interviewing you. What is something you would ask yourself? If I'm hosting the show and I'm interviewing me. I would ask, what, uh, as an entrepreneur, what's been your biggest challenge thus far in business? Yeah. What is your biggest challenge thus far? To be honest, and maybe it's because I've, recently been experiencing it a lot um going back to our conversation about males and how we're raised um the biggest challenge at least that i've been experiencing in this phase of business is loneliness and uh the psychological impacts of loneliness yeah like, dude, that's a deep one. I, I, I work in this office, right? This home office by myself every day. You have nobody to talk to. You think you're crazy because you have nobody to talk to. I could wake up. I could go to bed on a Tuesday feeling on top of the world. I could wake up on Wednesday morning and say, fuck this. I think I'm going to quit. Um, I wouldn't say this is depression, but it's like, yeah, you, you, you know, you, it, it's, it's, it's a grind. It is a mental, it doesn't need to be a, it doesn't need to be a grind. Like, Hey, I'm grinding for grinding sake, but mentally it's like, fuck dude, I got to go into the gauntlet again. Um, I don't think people think about that. I think people only see the glory that is exposed through social media and everybody just wants to hide their faults and hide those dark times. Dude, this thing's lonely. Yeah. Like it's fucking lonely. Um, that's, I think maybe a challenge that everybody's going through. Uh, but nobody wants to talk about like, dude, I'm not, I'm not concerned about, Oh, my ROI on ad spend. Let me figure out, you know, TikTok's algorithm like dude that's not really a challenge bro like the 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 ability to turn loneliness the ability to shift your business into like steps like if i do a plus b it equals c i think that's the hardest because you're constantly mind fucking yourself you know so I think that would be if I was to if I was the host, yeah, what the biggest struggle. And that that's that's my personal biggest struggle is not thinking that I have anybody, you know, and, and I'm constantly just talking to myself. You feel like you're going crazy. You're like, man, Dude, sometimes man, just isn't this something crazy? they showed like on psychology today? Like if you start talking to yourself and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, dude. It's just something that uh it's just not spoken about, I don't think. It's I think it's it's mentioned, but it's not talked yeah. about. They'll yeah. like, oh, you'll be lonely. Oh, you'll yeah. be lonely here. And like, you'll hear it on like YouTube videos or social media, but like, you don't really understand it until like you're in the trenches. You go, I haven't seen anybody in like three days, four days. It's been a week. I haven't, right. Yeah. You, you know, I haven't seen anybody in X amount of time for sure. Exactly. You know, my, my, my relationship with my wife is a little bit harder because she doesn't understand it. And I feel like I can't talk to her about it. So who the hell do you talk to? Your best friend lives with you, bro. My, my wife is my best friend. And like, she won't understand it, you know, like, Hey dude, <clears throat> it's December. Hey bro, 
thank you for busting your ass. You got a bonus this year. Like Lauren, <clears throat> you got a bonus this year and I am fucking, I am proud because that is everything for our household. That, that helps us tremendously, right? Well, I have to just tell you something. You're going to see me like 40% less during this stretch of time because if you want me to get a bonus, dude, I got to go sell something. And you you can't like, I have to go work, right? right? So like, that's another hard thing. It's like, not only is it just mentally draining because you always feel alone, but then it's like, dude, you have to be alone because you got to go work uh, and you have to earn a bonus and you have to keep, you know, upgrading and, and people don't just flock to you, you know? Yeah, no, I get that. I mean, especially like, because so my dad's a pardon that y'all know if you can hear the yard work outside, but uh, Come on, uh, bro. my dad's oh, a man. serial entrepreneur. Ever since I was born, like you know, like uh, growing up, his office in my room, like where my cradle was, it was the same room. So like I've seen that entrepreneurial lifestyle, and like for a long time, like he was just kind of like he'd be away either like traveling or gone or in his office. And you know, growing up, you don't really understand that, but once you get to this point, you start doing this, so you go, oh, this is what's required. Like this yeah. is kind of the name of the game. Like you need there, this loneliness is it's self-induced, but it's self-induced for a reason. Like this is where you grow. This is where you make those sales. This is where you actually build something. And like a lot of people just don't get that because they'll be like, dude, like, just come on out. Like, let's go do this. Like, let's go have fun. Let's take a weekend off. Let's take a week off. Like, you know, there's times to be able to go do that. But a lot of the time is no, I gotta be, I gotta do this. I'm gonna, if I'm going to have my bonus, like you said, I gotta be right here. Yeah. And that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. And I think that's where a lot of people get weeded out because they're like, I don't want that. I want to be able to have, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and go out on the, uh, go out at night and like, you know, be able to just chill. Sometimes yeah. you don't really get that. You can have seasons yeah. where it's like that, but you don't really get that all the time. No, man. No. And uh, I think the one thing is uh, if I could, I think I'm good with it. I'm good with the communication with my wife. Like yeah. we're pretty spot on, but I don't think everybody is like that and people need to be, especially if you have a spouse and, and, and you're going to start an own business or, you know, whatever, it, maybe you're the wife, maybe you're the, the guy, like, dude, you need to, you need to open up and you need to tell them like, Hey, this is the deal. Because if you don't, it is going to be extremely taxing on that relationship, you know? So you, yeah, yeah, you have to, just as much as you're trying to prepare yourself for it, dude, you need to prepare the other side. It's huge. It, it goes way deeper than people realize. Yeah. And I hope that's, you know, it, it's tough. It's hard. But once you look at the other side of where it could end up, like the result, it's beautiful. So absolutely man. sacrifice for the long-term gain. That's what it's all about. Awesome. Well, Mark, this has been that now that was a banger of a conversation to end everything on that was absolutely amazing dude this has been an incredible conversation i know everybody listening is going to love this if anybody wants to connect with you or they want to push your message or or be involved in your training or anything like that how can they go about contacting you yeah just uh hit me on ig um i'm pretty much at the mark forster on all platforms um but Instagram is probably the best. Um, but again, yeah, at the Mark Forster on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, it's all the same. LinkedIn, it's all the same. Sweet. Awesome. Everybody listening, go, go follow Mark, go talk, go, go learn from his story, go be part of his training, do all of that. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was an absolute pleasure. And everybody, until next time, stay healthy, get wealthy. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Young, Healthy, and Wealthy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on all platforms, whether that be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you are enjoying this podcast from. If you know someone who could benefit from the message you heard today, please do not be a stranger. Send it to them. You never know how much it could impact someone's life. I am your host, Chase A.P. Henderson. And until next time, stay healthy, get wealthy.